What's going on, Psychology Crew? We are back at it here today on a short week, uh, only two days of class this week. Hope you guys enjoy those extra days and enjoy the Easter holiday this weekend. We'll obviously be back at it next week. So uh, as far as today, a uh, quick little announcement for AP Psych folk. All right, so AP Psych, uh, check out that extra video on the video page for you guys, basically explaining all of the changes that we know right now as far as how the AP test is going to roll. Um, and uh, if you check that out on the review day last time, uh, you can still watch it one more time, just a little bit of review. I'm sure a lot more information will be coming out, and as soon as it does come out, I will get with you guys on that. Uh, but other than that, let's just get right into the lesson today. Uh, we're still kind of driving through that personality uh, lesson, and uh, I got one thing to finish up on psychodynamic approach, and then we're going to spend most of our time today in the humanistic approach. Okay, so let's look at this first. All right, a projective test. Uh, this is uh, something that psychodynamic psychologists would use to try to get a glimpse into that unconscious mind. Remember, the psychodynamic approach has a lot to do with the unconscious mind, the unconscious desires, sexual and aggressive that you have, um, and they like to dive into your past to find out, you know, what has made you feel this way, what has made you have these troubles that you're dealing with. Uh, and a projective test is one test uh, that they've used to do that. So, what is a projective test? Really, it's any test that provides you an ambiguous stimulus and it's designed to trigger the projection of one's inner dynamics, right? So it, they're hoping to get a glimpse of that unconscious mind. They're hoping to get a glimpse of maybe uh, what unconscious things lie below the surface that's causing you to have these troubles that you're having. So probably the most famous example is the bottom one there, the uh, Rorschach inkblot test, which by the way, hopefully you've paid attention to the video this far through because I got another extra credit uh, possibility for you. If you can look me up, uh, Rorschach's first name, and spell it correctly, send it to me in a Canvas message, along with, which by the way, Rorschach is one of the best looking men in psychology. Okay, it really is. I'm not going to just be, you know, uh, you know, weird about it, but he is. I mean, he's, he's, he's a good looking guy, you know? So um, take a look at him and tell me, one, what his first name is, and spell it correctly. Okay, you don't spell it correctly, you don't get the points. And number two, uh, tell me through a Google Images search, maybe, uh, who the Hollywood, current Hollywood star is that they think he most resembles. And I think the resemblance is shocking. And he truly is one of the best looking men in all of psychology that we're going to talk about this entire year. So you do those two things for me just for paying attention to this video. Send them to me in Canvas message and I'll give you two points of extra credit on top of the secret message if you can figure that out today. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to actual psychology stuff. Uh, the Rorschach inkblot test is one you guys are familiar with. They show you inkblots and they basically say, what do you see? And uh, what we hope happens if we're psychodynamic psychologists doing this projective test is that they start to see things that are reflective of what they are feeling inside, right? Uh, and we're supposed to ask additional questions from there as a therapist. Uh, but probably the more common one used today is the thematic apperception test. It's almost always abbreviated TAT. So if you see TAT on any resources for AP psychology, it's referring to the thematic apperception test. And this is one that's kind of shown more in the middle of the bottom of this slide right here, uh, where it shows a person or a situation where there's a motion being shown and uh, they would ask maybe this person here who's looking at this girl who has her head in her hands uh, and looks very distressed uh, tell me a story that goes with this woman why is she looking this way right now and obviously what we're wanting to happen is maybe somebody describes her as something they're going through you know maybe she's stressed out about this that or the other and then we say oh have you ever been stressed out about those things have those things ever caused you some stress or anxiety and then we kind of go from there uh, into understanding what's causing the person the problems that they're having so yeah thematic apperception test probably is a little bit more today than the Rorschach inkblot test Rorschach inkblot test does have a lot of critics as far as like um, you know how valid it is you know and, and validity we're gonna talk about this later but validity is basically is this test testing what it's supposed to be testing and we're not really sure Rorschach inkblot test has great validity. So uh, just one criticism of it. Okay, so done with psychodynamic approach to personality. Let's dive into the humanistic approach to psychology. The yang to the psychodynamic yang. This is the much more positive approach on psychology, looking at how great people are and how good people can, can be, uh, much to the, you know, uh, contrary with that psychodynamic approach, right? They were kind of saying, oh, people are evil and weird on the inside and they're just trying to overcome those things. Uh, not with the humanistic approach. Humanistic approach, much more positive approach to psychology. We know about Abraham Maslow, right? When we talk about humanistic psychology, we're always talking about two people. 
Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. Okay, so we know a little bit about Abraham Maslow here. We've studied his hierarchy of human needs, uh, and we know that those first two terms right here, self-actualization and self-transcendence, are things that he put at the top of that that pyramid, the top of that hierarchy. Uh, we know self-actualization means that it's a, a person becoming the best possible version of themselves, and we know that self-transcendence is even farther than self-actualization. Basically, saying that somebody has became the best possible version of themselves to the point where they are inspiring others to be the the best possible version of their self. So uh, self-actualization and self-transcendence, once again, self-transcendence, finding a purpose even beyond yourself uh, that is more important than that self. Um, and, and you guys could probably think about a, an example like Gandhi, right? He found a purpose in his life that was bigger than even he was, bigger than him, bigger than his life. Um, so yeah, uh, that would be a self-transcendence. Uh, and then peak experiences, the other uh, term you see here is a, uh, a term that Maslow used to talk about those, those aha moments, those moments in somebody's life where everything just becomes more clear and they have a better understanding of who they are and where they fit into this world as. Uh, and peak experiences can be a lot of different things. Uh, some of them you maybe would expect, like uh, you know, high school graduation or maybe college graduation, um, those big like uh, initiation rites or those big uh, rites of passage, right? Uh, but sometimes these peak experiences come in, you know, a moment where you would not expect them, right? Just something happens in your life where you start to realize uh, what is truly important to you uh, and, and how that may have changed from your past self, right? So those are peak experiences. Uh, but let's go on to, to my guy. All right, this is my guy, guys. I mean, uh, Carl Rogers is a guy I am fascinated with. Maybe I have a slight man crush on him. I don't know. But like Carl Rogers is, is, is so good, guys. Like the stuff that he talks about, I relate to so much. Um, the thing that he talks about with person-centered therapy, I think, is how therapy should be done, and I think that's how most therapists today in the psychology realm and the psy psychiatrist realm are doing things. They're not using a Freudian approach as much as they are using a person-centered perspective that Carl Rogers basically built from the ground up. Um, he would even uh, do this person-centered therapy with with prison, uh, you know, inmates and. Uh, basically tell them how much they, they mattered and, and how he was interested in what they were doing with their life, even though they're behind bars and, and have committed horrific acts, right? Uh, he thought even those people uh, deserve to have somebody in their life that, that had these three aspects right here, genuineness, acceptance, and empathy. Um, he thought that created a really growth-promoting climate, and he thought when you were a therapist sitting down uh, with a client, uh, if the client didn't know that, that they were getting genuineness from you, acceptance from you, and empathy from you. There could never really be good therapy done because uh, there is not that give and take. There's not that comfortability, right? So so genuineness, just being a genuine person, right? Uh, not trying to be fake, not trying to be somebody you're not, accepting you for your flaws. Uh, that rolls right into acceptance no matter what you've done in your past, no matter how many times you fell short of a goal, uh, just knowing that somebody accepts you. And then empathy, truly trying to put yourself in that person's perspective when you're talking to to them and understanding where they're coming from. Uh, a big term that you got to know with Carl Rogers is unconditional positive regard. Unconditional positive regard, he believed, was not just the best thing that a, a patient could get from their therapist or a client could get from their therapist. It was the most important thing one human being could give to another. Like that's what he believed. He believed the most important thing one person could give to another is unconditional positive regard. And you probably could paraphrase that and call it unconditional love. But love is like, eh, it's a squishy term. It's not really a scientific term. So, you know, we don't use it in AP psychology. But unconditional positive regard is exactly what it says. Uh, acceptance no matter what. Right? There is no conditions on your acceptance. It's not I'm going to love you if you're good at sports or I'm going to love you if you get all A's. It's I love you with all your flaws. It's I care about you and I'm going to be in your corner no matter what goes on, no matter how many bad decisions you make. Uh, I'm going to be there for you and I'm going to be a guiding force there for you. So he believed that was the most important thing one person could give to another. And then finally, self-concept. He believed if you got unconditional positive regard from other people, uh, it helps your self-concept and it helps you grow as a person and how you view yourself. So Carl Rogers, my man, okay? Um, on to slide four here. This is the fourth slide. And what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of transition. 
we're going to transition to kind of talking about some of the uh, the negatives or the shortcomings of some of these different uh, perspectives on personality. And I'm actually going to shift gears and start talking about the trait perspective. Uh, remember, the trait perspectives is like the Myers-Briggs test that we took, right? So Myers-Briggs, you guys have all taken that uh, that survey before. And Myers-Briggs basically tells you or describes you as extroverted or introverted, uh, right? Sensing or perceiving, uh, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so, so yeah, um, basically what a self-report test is, is, uh, a test that you take, right? Like you answer questions about yourself and you guys might remember on that Myers-Briggs test that we took in class, it asked you questions about like, you know, uh, are you somebody that procrastinates on assignments or are you somebody that, uh, you know, uh, are, are more comfortable talking to people than writing in a journal, that kind of stuff. And uh, basically that relies on you answering accurately. And that's okay most of the time, but sometimes we answer it according to our ideal self versus our, our actual self, right? Like ideally, do I want to get in all my assignments early and on time? Yes, I do. But the truth is, like, like that's my ideal self, but the truth is my actual self maybe does procrastinate a little bit, right? So uh, when you start answering questions according to your ideal self and not your actual self, it obviously throws off the results uh, of any of those trait perspective uh, self-inventories. So uh, the humanistic perspective has a little bit of that as well, has a little bit of that, uh, that argument against it uh, for that same reason, ideal self versus actual self. Of course we want to give unconditional positive regard to others. Of course we want to put others uh, on a very high pedestal and show them that we care about them, but do we do we always do that? No, we don't, right? So, um, problem with self-report tests. Uh, let's put a psychology term with it here. Uh, one specific psychology term is the self-serving bias, right? Uh, we perceive ourselves more favorably than we probably should. We view ourselves as better than average most of the time, even though that kind of flies in the face of the term average, right? So, uh, yeah, and it's proven in society as well, right? In society, we see people all the time accept more responsibility for things that they do that are good and things that other people celebrate and maybe don't accept responsibility for those things that we do that are bad or maybe accept responsibility for our failures as much. Uh, we're always ready to, to raise our hand and say we're the one that did the right thing, uh, but when it comes to us messing up, which we do, and, and failing, which we do, uh, we don't uh, take responsibility for that as, as quickly, right? So uh, that, that kind of all feeds into the self-serving bias. And then when it comes into perspective here with the trait perspective, and we're taking these self-inventories, uh, it, it does hurt that most people see themselves as a little better than average, okay? So uh, we're going to dive into the trait perspective next time. Uh, and the trait perspective is things like uh, CANOE, if you guys remember that acronym, C-A-N-O-E. And it is going to be things like the Myers-Briggs, which we took a test over in AP Psychology before the uh, year ended. But uh, we'll get into that next time. So that will be the, uh, the next lesson we go into, which will be next week. Uh, so I will see you guys then.